everyone. Welcome to session 125 of the Behavioral Observations Podcast. Boy, I've got a great episode to share with you today. I had the opportunity to speak with Drs. Karina Jimenez-Gomez and Chris Podlesnik, and we spent the majority of our time talking about translational research and behavior analysis, and we covered important topics like resurgence, renewal, relapse, and generalization. And uh, boy, did they go deep on these topics. So I think you're going to come out on the other end with a better appreciation of what these concepts are. Um, we also discussed things like the uh, the ABA Science blog, which I highly recommend checking out. And we kind of accidentally stumbled into a sidebar about what it's like to be a married couple in academia. So in a rare deviation from behavioral observations protocol, I, uh, I guess... Uh, didn't mind my own business per se, and we got into a little conversation about that, which I found interesting. Uh, this is an episode where the show notes will be especially helpful. There are tons of articles that they mentioned and links and resources, and books, and more things along those lines. So I encourage you to check them out over at behavioralobservations.com. There's also a, a graph that uh, that Chris references as well. I've posted it in the show notes for easy reference. So Again, uh, you can find all this and more at behavioralobservations.com. And real quick before our conversation, we'll let you know that this particular episode is sponsored by the 2020 New Hampshire Association for Behavior Analysis Virtual Conference. That's right, New Hampshire ABBA is, it's only a handful of years old, but for a small estate, our conference has punched above its weight, if I do say so myself. The 2020 event will be no exception. This year's speakers list includes Drs. Solande Forte, Deb Grosset, Bridget Taylor, Alyssa Wilson, Camille Kolu, and Emily Sandoz. New Hampshire ABBA also acknowledges that the pandemic has resulted in financial burdens on many behavior analysts, so they've decided to use a values-based registration fee which means that while there are suggested registration fees, depending on whether you're a professional member, student, et cetera, et cetera, uh, you can participate in this event for a lot less if that's appropriate to your financial situation. So for more information, check out New Hampshire, uh, excuse me, nhaba.net. And I hope hope you choose to join us virtually on September 26th. Again, that's nhaba.net. And of course, I'll have this over at behavioralobservations.com as well. We're also brought to you by HRIC Recruiting. Barb Voss has been placing BCBAs in permanent positions throughout the United States for just about a decade. And she's been in the recruiting business more generally for 30 years. So when you work with HRIC, you work directly with Barb, thereby accessing highly personalized service. So if you're about to graduate, you're looking for a change of pace, or just want to know if the grass really is greener on the other side... Head over to hricolorado.com to schedule a confidential chat right away. Lastly, I want to mention that the Behavioral Observations podcast has a membership program. Think of it as my uh, do-it-yourself Patreon. It's been running for a few years now, and it costs the princely sum of $9 a month. Members get access to a private Facebook group in which they're able to get nearly instantaneous access to the videos of these podcast interviews. The best part is that members get the raw feed. That means no ads and none of these introductory comments. You just get right to the interview. Another cool thing that we do is we hold Zoom hangouts with former guests. We do this about a half a dozen times a year. And that's where we just have a big old hangout and members get to ask guests questions directly. So if you're interested to learn more about that, go to behavioralobservations.com forward slash membership. All right. So I think that's it for opening comments. So without any further delay, please enjoy this fascinating conversation on translational research and behavior analysis. Welcome to the Behavioral Observations Podcast, stimulating talk for today's behavior analysts. Now, here's your host, Matt Sicoria. All right, I'm joined by not one, but two great guests today, Drs. Karina Jimenez-Gomez and Chris Podlesnik. How are you guys doing today? Hi, how are you? Doing well, thanks. How are you? Very good, very good. Thanks for joining me today. Um, We've got a a uh, uh, ambitious agenda, I should say, <laughs> of uh, talking about translational research, which probably 
we could do many, many shows on, but I think we'll probably just kind of dip our toe in the water and acquaint our listeners with the general issue and uh, talk about some of the work that you guys have done down there at my alma mater of Auburn University. So I guess we should get the uh, obligatory War Eagles out of the way. That's right. <laughs> uh, we're new here, so uh, we're not quite <laughs> comfortable. With- it, do- it doesn't quite roll off the tongue just yet. <laughs> Um, well, well, being that you guys are new here, let's start by uh, talking about how you guys got into behavior analysis in the first place. So, um, uh, who wants to go first? Yeah. Um, okay, I'll start. So, I um, I studied psychology in Venezuela, and I was trained by people who were not behavioral, and I was doing a lot of clinical work, and and then I kind of stumbled upon people that were doing research in a lab with rats, and I thought that was pretty interesting, and I ended up doing my undergraduate thesis under Cristina Vargas, who was doing basic work. And I learned how to program on these old, tiny relay racks that nobody uses anymore. And I did my thesis on delayed reinforcement. And I went to ABI in 2001 in New Orleans to present a poster on my thesis. And that was kind of the beginning of everything. So that's after that, that's where I met Tim Shahan, who I ended up doing my doctoral work with at USU and, you know, being trained with a background in psychology, just kind of general, more clinician approach, and then being trained by Tim as a basic researcher, those things kind of came together. And I am here now doing kind of translational and applied behavior analysis. Very cool. Story, There's a lot more. This is like the <laughs> short right. version of that's like the Cliff Notes version. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, all right. So, um, Chris, how about yourself? Um, well, I went to West Virginia University, which is you know well known to be sort of one of those bastions of behavior analysis. I did um, an undergraduate honors thesis and worked some graduate students before that with Phil Chase. Um, so you know with instructions and you know, OBM and all that stuff, just kind of getting my feet wet. And I did other uh, more basic laboratory work in uh, Andy Latow's lab, uh, Adam Dowdy and others. And uh, from there, uh, you know, I also worked at a psychiatric hospital, which is you know, more general psychology. It was an interesting experience. And I saw how little organization there was in that psychiatric hospital. And so it seemed like uh, the behavior analytic framework had a lot to offer. Um, I, in fact, also went to that 2001 um, ABAI in New Orleans, and we remember, actually, I was talking to Amy Odom, and Karina was talking to Tim Shahan. We didn't know one another, remember seeing one another. We ne- didn't interact at all, but yet later on, we ended up uh, going to grad school, going to grad school together. Uh, so I also worked with, with Tim Shahan. Um, actually married as well too so. oh, okay all right cool i wasn't gonna pry but thank you for, <laughs> for disclosing I, I, so uh, it, uh you, you guys wouldn't be the first uh, couple that we've we've had but uh, not together though so i guess this is a this is a first uh, as it relates to that so pretty cool pretty cool so a little another uh one of the many uh a- aba connections that uh that right. we've we've seen in this in this field over the years so um and so you guys are uh, at Auburn right now. And uh, so um, we've moved around a bunch and we are, we just, we've been here for a year, but yeah, we've moved around a ton. I see. Uh, I, you know, I, w- I hadn't planned to ask about this, but I'm just curious. I've got some other friends of mine who are kind of academic couples. Uh, I have to imagine that places a unique challenge on finding jobs and things like that because you're not looking for one position or one faculty slot you're looking for for two and it's got to be the right mix and things along those lines body problem it's called the what the two body problem oh really there's an actual day to it yeah (laughs) yeah academics you know all over the spectrum have the issue of trying to find two jobs and uh you know departments and deans and so on want to minimize the amount they spend meanwhile you know you can have a very good combo, but uh, the money is not there. Or just the need for a particular position is not there at the time. Um, we are in the same field. Sometimes it's you know in very different fields, and that can add uh, some benefits, but other challenges as well. So yeah. it, it's a, it is a a big challenge. Uh, our advisors, uh, Tim Shahan and Amy Odom, dealt with that, and others have as well. So, yeah, but I think more and more universities are recognizing. The issue, you know, you spend so much time in graduate school 
during a particular time of your life where you're likely to meet your spouse. And, and then if you want to pursue an academic career, then universities have to be open to that. So Auburn actually has a program for spousal hires and a lot of other universities are starting to do that because they recognize the need to kind of keep people together. You keep people together, they're happier, then they're more likely to stay. You don't want faculty rotating. I mean, we've rotated quite a bit, but you know, we don't want to keep moving and people typically don't want to keep moving. I can understand that. Yeah. So, yeah. So, I mean, I, I have to imagine perhaps in, in many cases it would be a, 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 a benefit, uh, you know, for those reasons and, and others certainly. So that's, that's pretty neat. Recruiting, recruiting faculty and giving them startup and all that stuff is extremely expensive to the university. So when someone comes and they realize in two or three years, like there's no path for their spouse and they get up and leave and it's a really a, big uh, expense for the university to go through the process of hiring and stuff again. And if they hire yet again, someone who has a spouse and yeah, so there's some, be- a lot of benefit for the university to do it. There's obviously a lot of benefit for the academics involved. Nice. Nice. Um, all right. So let's, uh, th- th- thanks for allowing me to be a, a little bit nosy with that. I just, it's one of those <laughs> things I've seen here and there and I always wonder how it works. So I appreciate that. Um, but l- let's transition to talking about, uh, the, um, the ABAI, ABAI science blogs. And, uh, Karina, that's the, I guess the, the yeah. context under which you reached out. So, uh, wh- why don't you take a minute and kind of talk about those? Cause, I don't know if it's something a lot of people know about, and uh, this would be yeah. a good opportunity to uh, let people know of this resource. Super, yeah. The ABI blog started in 2018. So in 2018, I think it was like early 2018, January, February, somewhere around there. Um, Ruth Ann Redfelt reached out to me. She and Maria Malott had, well, in the uh, executive board of ABI, had started this as a way to disseminate our science and kind of reach a broader audience. And even talk amongst ourselves, really, because, I mean, oftentimes, if you have somebody who's purely applied, they may read Java, but not JAB and vice versa. So this was, the idea of this was to get people from various areas of behavioral science, behavior analysis, to write in a way that would be easily consumable by people outside of our field, so that we could talk about kind of interesting things that are happening, how we can contribute to solving socially significant problems, and just kind of dissemination is the purpose of it. Um, I've rotated off as the autism blogger, um, and I'm now coordinating all the blogs. We added an OBM one this year that Nicole Gravina is overseeing, which I'm really excited about because I think there are a lot of interesting things um, that we can add from that perspective. And, I mean, interesting things have happened. So, like, recently I had an email from this woman. I had a blog about dissemination of behavior analysis outside of the United States. And one of them was in Spanish speaking countries because that's my primary language. And uh, I had a woman from Bolivia email me that she had stumbled upon it. She's a mom of a kid with autism and she stumbled upon the blog and she was asking me if I knew of any resources in South America for getting behavior analytic treatment for her son. And it was just really cool to see that, you know, this thing that I write, um, goes into the internet and you don't even know if anybody's reading it. Suddenly this woman had, you know, Googled autism treatments in Spanish and she found it. So it was really nice to see that it's kind of reaching this broader audience. And I've heard from various people that similar things are happening. So we're, we're continuing to work and hoping that people are finding them useful. And if people have specific topics they want to see covered, then we're more than happy to, to kind of try to disseminate our signs that way. Great. And I'll make sure that people can go to the show notes of today's episode and find out how to reach you to share those topic ideas. Uh, you did mention that, uh, that, you know, there's an OBM blog uh, and an, an autism one. What are some other topics that, that are yeah. covered in the, in the one that Derek Reed started that now um, somebody who was his former student is taken over was under the dome. So looking at applications of behavior analysis and things that are outside of autism DD type of, science is some of the work that he's done with like behavioral economics. We also have a verbal behavior one, one that's kind of RFT type um, stuff. Um, What else do we have? I don't know. We have about six of them. I wish I had a list in front of my face right now. Oh, that's okay. I know I'll put you on the spot, (laughs) but people can go to science 
dot aba international dot org uh and uh find out more about what's offered there so um uh so that's a that's a cool resource and again we'll we'll share that in today's show notes if you're out driving around or walking your dog and or whatever hey i know i mentioned this at the beginning of the episode just in case you skipped ahead uh, which personally I wouldn't judge. Uh, I want to let you know that New Hampshire ABBA has an awesome virtual conference coming up. Yes, it's virtual, and that means that uh, we can stay safe and just about anyone in the world can attend if they want to. There's an amazing speaker roster, uh, all female. It's uh, Dr. Solande Forte, Deb Grossett, Bridget Taylor, Alyssa Wilson, Camille Kolu, and Emily Sandoz. Uh, there's also a kind of values-based registration fee. So New Hampshire ABBA recognizes that the pandemic has hit uh, some number of behavior analysts pretty hard financially. And so there's a there's some variable pricing uh, available, and uh, it's just going to be a great event. Uh, again, it's September 26th. It's virtual. NHABA.net is where you can learn more information, or just go to behavioralobservations.com. I hope to virtually see you there. Thanks for checking it out. All right, so let's let's talk about some of the the, the translational topics that you guys had suggested. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, you got you end up sending me a few papers, uh, a JEA paper, a Java paper, and, and there's there's uh, one other that um, uh, I think the was the journal Learning and Motivation. I think it was, uh, and all kind of talking about this topic of of um, resurgence, relapse, renewal, uh, and uh, you know, as someone who once worked in a, in a kind of old school pigeon lab, and then uh, another uh, and, and, and then another animal lab with with, um, with dogs, uh, uh, a lot of this stuff kind of came back, but a lot of the the, the terms were were kind of new and whatnot. Um, but but the neat thing about these three papers that kind of, uh, especially the Java one, is that it uh, provided some great guidance uh, for uh, clinicians. You know, the the majority of behavior analysts out there, of course, are are working in applied settings, generally supporting individuals with with autism or behavior challenges or you know, things along those lines. So uh, a lot of great takeaways as well. Uh, but the but again, the general topic was renewal, resurgence, relapse, and things like that. So I think one place I'd like to start is just let's just talk about some terms here. You know, so uh, what what is the what is the uh, we can either define those terms specifically or or talk about the general problem of you know. A, a, generalizing treatment effects to target settings and things like that. So I'll let you guys kind of take that in whatever direction you like in terms of setting up the, the topic. Yeah. Um, so one of the uh, issues with any problem behavior, problem behavior, compulsive behavior, persistent behavior, all of the problem behaviors are sort of defined by the fact that uh, relapse is likely move the pointer off your nose. Um, <laughs> that, that, uh, one of the things that sort of defines persistent behavior is the fact that relapse is likely. Um, so whenever you're dealing with things like addiction or severe problem behavior, um, even like patterns of problematic eating and so on, is that even if you have an intervention that you're uh, skillfully implement and it works well under certain circumstances, circumstances change for all kinds of different reasons. And uh, whenever those things change, you can see a return in the problem behavior, breakdown in maybe appropriate behavior that was taught to replace that. And so that's sort of the general issue of relapse. You know, so when, when you're talking about addiction, you might, uh, someone might go to treatment and get their drug use down to low or zero levels. Um, but then they uh, do something like return to their old neighborhood or a friend comes and visits and so on and so forth. There are environmental changes that come to cause a return to the problem behavior. Uh, yeah. You know, it, I, I have a, a friend of mine who um, one of his uh, uh, children, unfortunately um, became addicted to um, um, opiates and uh, successfully went through treatment and when, thank goodness. And uh, when coming out, the, the, the clinicians were telling the family, plan for relapse you know in other words it's part of the de- the recovery deal you know so it was, it was it wasn't just you know the kind of train and hope that we'll you know we'll, we'll probably touch on in a little bit but it was like this is a something that is that is very likely to occur and you need to have plans to 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 deal with it and 
So. Yeah, and to see the same sort of things with treatment of severe problem yeah. behavior. Like you said, with all the different problematic behaviors as a defining feature, the reason why they are a problem is because relapse happens. You know, the famous quote about uh, from Mark Twain, you know, quitting smoking is easy. I've done it a thousand times. Yeah, it's just, if you know someone has a behavioral problem, the problem is usually not getting it to go away initially. It's staying mm -hmm. at those... Uh, sort of healthy levels. Sure, sure. So, um, and, and so can you guys take a minute and just kind of distinguish relapse from renewal and resurgence, particularly in the, you know, how, how the, I guess the taxonomy of how that works in, in some of the studies that, uh, that, that you had sent me? Sure. Um, so relapse is really kind of an umbrella term for these different uh, other more specific procedures that tap into processes. Um, so I should also say that all these terms that we talk about, in addition to um, being a procedure, you know, what are the environmental variables that precipitate uh, a behavioral effect? Um, those that you can call them relapse procedures and so on and so forth. But then there's the effect on behavior, which also is sometimes called relapse. So just like extinction, Extinction is a set of procedures, you know, you withdraw the reinforcer contingent upon the behavior, but you also talk about extinction as being a process. So, uh, it can get a little bit confusing sometimes, and you have to remember that, you know, even as I'm talking, I might say, say relapse, and one time I mean a procedure, and other times I might mean the process right. that underlies, which um, you can get deeper and deeper, of course, into process uh, with research and stuff like that. But um, so relapse is really uh, both can refer to procedures and the process of when you get that a reduction in behavior with a treatment effect, something in the environment can come to make that treatment effect go away. The problem behavior, behavior comes back. Uh, now there are the specific uh, procedures, the specific effects. Uh, there are various ways that the environment can change that produces relapse, and this is really one of the challenges to anyone who treats any sort of problem behavior, is that it's not just like, there's this one thing you gotta worry about, and you focus on that. Uh, the, uh, the things that influence relapse are uh, multiple, interactive, and so on. And so when you, I can sort of, I guess, start with one, and then we can move on into others. Um, I guess I'll, I'll start, um, I'll flip a coin, I guess. Um, I'll, I'll start with resurgence, I guess, because if uh, people are very comfortable and understand differential reinforcement, and that's sort of at the heart of resurgence. And so everyone, everyone who uh, is familiar with doing any interventions on almost any problem behavior, whether it's extremely, just, just a little bit annoying or extremely severe self-injury or something like that, understands differential reinforcement. And the idea with resurgence and most of these relapse procedures have three phases in their most basic form. And the first phase, there's uh, reinforcement of some target behavior that simulates kind of that natural history of reinforcement that happens under natural conditions. So, you know, um, an individual engages in problem behavior, uh, tantruming or self-injury or, or, you know, use of drugs or whatever um, that happens under natural circumstances. The idea is that, you know, that behavior is maintained by some consequence. And so that in the laboratory, that target behavior is reinforced to simulate that natural history. So that's phase one. In phase two is sort of where the intervention, the treatment is implemented. And that's where you see the reduction uh, in the, the target behavior with the, with the treatment effect. And in the laboratory, this is simulated by introducing uh, extinction for all of the relapse models when you're talking about specifically with resurgence and it's differential reinforcement that target behavior you extinguish that uh, at the same time as you train up some more appropriate behavior with differential reinforcement of alternative behavior it's a communication response and be a functional communication training uh, but the idea there is then you know you get a reduction in the problem behavior an increase in the appropriate behavior and that's what everyone is pretty comfortable with uh, who does almost any sort of applied behavior analysis. Um, and then and there are all kinds of demonstrations of that being extremely effective. Um, lots of reviews showing that you can get sort of that 
treatment effect below 80% in 90 some percent of the cases, and it's really a robust effect. But you know, those are oftentimes under very controlled situations where a trained individual is implementing the intervention, sometimes even at a, a clinic and so on. Um, so that's a relatively easy effect to get. Not all the time, of course, but sometimes that's a fairly easy thing to do if it's a socially maintained behavior. But now the phase three comes on. Once you have successful intervention, you have problem behavior low. The third phase happens um, with, and again, with all the relapse models, this is sort of the challenge to the treatment. And in the case of resurgence, you stop reinforcing the alternative response. So these would be called like omission errors. Um, you, if the appropriate response is the individual who has the problem behavior engages in the appropriate response, that's not reinforced. What can happen then, you know, this individual's most recently taught to engage in this appropriate behavior, that's not working. What are they going to do? Their behavior will resurge to back to the problem behavior. Um, and so that's sort of an extreme challenge, but of course, you know, whenever um, you, maybe you're handing over the intervention to a caregiver or something like that, that you get those types of, uh, those omission errors, those errors in treatment integrity that can produce a resurgence back to the problem behavior. And so that's an issue of treatment maintenance, getting that treatment to maintain under different situations. Um, so that's, Resurgence in a nutshell, and there's lots and lots of research, basic research, um, theoretical work, and quite a bit of clinical research now going into that as well. I see. And um, I think in a minute, we'll probably get to what are some things we can do to kind of prevent that. Um, um, and I think, I mean, for resurgence, it really points to things like the importance of treatment integrity, um, issues of making sure the communicative response or replacement response is not too effortful that individuals will readily go back to the previous response. I mean, there are all these things that are really important in terms of implementing treatment that kind of go in to making uh, resurgence more or less likely. And it's kind of what Chris is alluding to in terms of the research that's out there and things that you know, as a, as a clinician, one might not think about or consider when you're thinking about planning out your intervention. Are you looking for a new job, but you're overwhelmed with all the emails that you're getting from various ABA agencies? What if there was someone who was in your corner and could help you find the perfect job placement? Well, that person exists. Barbara Voss has been working as a recruiter for over 30 years, and her company, HRIC, specializes in placing BCBAs in permanent full-time positions throughout the United States. Barbara has been placing BCBAs since 2011, so she knows our business, and she offers personalized service to any BCBA looking for a new position. She also helps companies looking to hire BCBAs, too. Here are just some of the things Barbara can help you with. She can provide information about salary ranges in different markets across the country. She can help you write your resume. She can coordinate and prepare you for the interview process and even help negotiate the right salary for you. And best of all, there are no charges to any candidate for all of these services. When you are ready to make a change and want to work with someone who will listen to you and understand what you need in a new position, contact Barbara at HRIC. To schedule a confidential discussion, head over to hricolorado.com. Again, that's hricolorado.com and hit the contact button to connect with Barbara. You won't be disappointed. I want to get back to some of the, I guess, the, the laboratory analogs of these things, because uh, one of the um, uh, helpful ways, at least at least for me that I thought was cool is looking at this is looking at these research preparations. We have context A, context B, context C uh, in terms of, so can you guys kind of walk? Yeah. Yeah. Walk, walk through how, how that, uh, that that's looked at in, in again, these kind of like uh, laboratory analogs of what is likely going on in, the, in quote unquote, the real world. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so th there are lots of ways to go from here. Um, so, Resurgence is all about differential reinforcement and then eliminating reinforcement for the appropriate alternative. You get a return in the, the problem behavior. And all this is simulated like with rats, it's pressing one lever versus another lever or nose pokes and stuff like that. Um, that can all be simulated and you can 
parametric, you manipulate all kinds of variables that influence that. So that's, that's resurgence. Renewal now is yet another relapse model, and it's described as both the procedure and a set of effects. And this is, so we're, whereas resurgence is more about control by contingencies of reinforcement, renewal is more about contextual control. You know, so the environmental events, the, the environmental stimuli, um, that which surrounds the, that context has been called, uh, referred to or described. And so it still has a three-phase procedure as a, uh, in its most general form. And what happens there is you still have that target response that's reinforced in phase one, again, simulating the natural environment, uh, natural history of reinforcement for that um, problem behavior. But the thing is that differs from resurgence and actually all the other relapse models is it happens in a particular context. So when we're talking about um, rats or pigeons or something like that, that's usually a particular uh, set of features of the chamber, right? So the rats will press levers or poker their noses in response and operand and stuff like that in an operant chamber. And so the sights, sounds, smells, tech, uh, uh, tactile features of the, the chamber might all be in a particular way during that natural history of re- simulated natural history of reinforcement, right? And so that's that baseline that you, you go with there, that reinforced problem behavior. The intervention comes in phase two, right? So there, usually it's simple extinction, but there are other ways to do this. But usually simple extinction is assessed, but the main thing there is the contextual features change. So all the sights and sounds uh, and uh, tactile features, all those things change in some way. So you kind of throw the kitchen sink, everything but the kitchen sink at it in terms of the context being different. Okay, so let me just make sure we're... um, um, with you guys. So in, in context A, basically you're establishing a pattern responding based on some sort of schedule of reinforcement. Yeah. yeah. Uh, um, and, and the, of, of the um, treatment for drug addiction, it's like the person consuming drugs in their hometown and they go to inpatient treatment. That would be the shift in context, completely different place or the interventions in place. Drugs are no longer available. And so it's extinction, right? And then they're just in a, complete, in a treatment context. So completely shifting. So we, the context A is establishing this history of reinforcement, which in clinical settings, you don't really have to establish. People come with it. <laughs> right. People come with the problem behavior that they've established in their home, school, whatever it is. Uh, so we see them in context B typically. But in the lab, you have to establish that history of the analog of the problem behavior. Got it. Got it. That's, that's helpful. That's a great applied example of it. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so when you extinguish in that novel context, that context B, so context A originally, context B is where the extinction, the treatment effect happens. And then what happens in that final phase, the most simple version is you maintain extinction, but you transition back to the A context, right? And even though extinction is still in effect, the transition back to the A context in and of itself can produce an increase in that problem behavior. So as you're talking about with like drug abuse or uh, treating problem, severe problem behavior in a clinic, right? You have the the home setting or the whatever, uh, where that natural history occurs, transitioning to the clinical setting, context B, you get reduction in the problem behavior. But when you transition back to that original context where the problem behavior was learned and reinforced and maintained and all that, despite there's no reinforcement there anymore, you get at least a transient increase in, in that uh, problem behavior. Uh, and so that uh, relapse model of renewal simulates those sort of natural environment that changes that really come with all kinds of different interventions that uh, are in place for problem behavior. I see. In the lab, you know, you go to that return to context A and you get this increase in problem behavior and you can control it, not contact and reinforcement. But in the real world, you know, if a child goes home and engages in problem behavior because of this change in context, they will likely encounter reinforcement because I mean, parents might just reinforce the tantruming or the escaping from the meal or whatever it is that was the problem. So it's a harder to control this withholding of 
reinforcement and really keeping extinction mm. in place. So in the lab, you model it, but then when you see it in the clinic, it's actually harder because you encounter some real world complications that you can control really well in a basic or more translational approach. Yeah, totally. You know, and um, again, I just want to remind listeners that uh, this is going to be an episode where the the show notes will be particularly helpful. And so what I think I'm going to do is uh, probably uh, cut and paste some of those graphs from those those articles that you sent me there. So they, I, I think looking at those three panel ABA yes. uh, preparations uh, will, will, will help kind of cement this, this, this concept. But uh, your point's obviously well taken in that... You know, um, in a lab, you just, you know, stop reinforcing the behavior and boom, you've got reduction. And then, uh, but obviously in the real world, that's a, a much more difficult thing to pull off. And the cool thing about the lab is that you can control things so that you can really identify what it is that matters. What are the relevant features of the intervention that we should be pulling into our clinical interventions that, you know, sometimes in the clinic, it's just, it's a mess. You know, there's just so many things going on that you, it's hard to do a, a really good component analysis of what ha- what was the, the relevant feature of your treatment package that mattered. Whereas in the lab, you can really break it down and say, what is it that matters? What is, what is it that I have to make sure the parent does when they go home and do implement this intervention? Yeah. Uh, go ahead. I have a, there's a, uh, another review paper I can send you that has a table that sort of lays out in very organized fashion phases one, two, and three with all the different relapse models. And we've talked about resurgence and renewal, but there's reinstatement and spontaneous recovery and so on and so forth. So all of these things um, can be studied in isolation and they have been for a long time. And I'm glad Karina brought that up because a lot of um, where people, well, where some people are starting to go now and that I think a lot of clinicians can appreciate is that, you have uh, things that produce a failure in treatment or a failure to maintain problems begat problems, right? You have, uh, so if you have a contextual change that might produce a little bit of renewal, but then the problem behavior might then be reinforced. And so you you get, you get some reinstatement of the problem behavior or rapid reacquisition of the problem behavior that might make the uh, person implementing kind of, you know, you know, confuse them a bit or something like that. And they may not reinforce the appropriate behavior. So then you get a little bit of resurgence, you know, so these sort of things can be studied in isolation in a laboratory, but very importantly, you can also combine them in the laboratory to study sort of how that process of um, one type that how one process might feed into the other process and how, or how one procedure can, uh, combine the additive, multiplicative, or you know, synergistic, all so on and so forth. Um, that's the really great thing about the, the laboratory work is that you can study those things in isolation. And I think, you know, as a person who likes to consider themselves a translational researcher, I really uh, think it's that's really an important component of uh, the the laboratory work is to be able to really understand um, the procedural aspects, but also, you know, then delve into some of the fundamental learning processes that contribute to all that. Because really the thing that is common among, uh, you know, a person who has addiction, a person who engages in severe problem behavior, you and me and maybe Karina, uh, is that the fundamental learning processes are there, right? We're all uh, biological behavioral organisms and we uh, adhere, our behavior is lawful. It adheres to certain laws and uh, the laboratories where we can understand those fundamental learning processes. And so you might have interventions that have moving parts and stuff like that, uh, but you're, that's sort of limited. If you have a good understanding of the fundamental learning processes, then that's the sort of key to really understanding what's going on in these circumstances. So even if, you know, a BCBA has no real, uh, training and fundamental learning processes. I think simply appreciating the fact that what's going on there is not just the intervention and its parts, but a biological behavioral organism who's interacting with their environment. Um, and to understand that, I think, is quite important. And then getting some training and doing some reading and uh, learning processes and behavioral processes, I think, helps a lot. But uh, simply appreciating 
that there's a biological behavioral organism there is, is really quite important. You know, I, I hadn't planned to ask this, but uh, you know that that's that's a great point. And um, I guess uh, short of cracking open Honig and Statin, you know, what what does the uh, the the what what are some uh, and seminal uh, either papers or seminal topics that you think would be helpful for the the everyday BCBA who may have gotten a little bit of this stuff in their grad training, probably not as much as you know. We would all like, because you know these programs have to make choices with limited resources and time and things like that. Um, you know, what, what, what would you guys suggest as as some some topics that people delve into to get a, a broader appreciation of some of these more fundamental learning processes? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, yeah. So you know, a lot of the textbooks uh, will provide good overview of um, learning processes, and there are a lot of textbooks out there um, from different sort of perspectives. There's the you know, Pearson Cheney that does a reasonably good job and is relatively uh, simple. It's, it's a bit, you know, they're all the textbooks are a bit on the long side. It, it sort of depends on, you can read specific articles for different areas. So if you're particularly interested in you know, um, relapse issues, you know, starting out with our, uh, our review that we sent you for, that's in Java about renewal is a good one or that one I mentioned before. Um, but like for broad surveys, just to start to appreciate the role of learning processes, probably a textbook is, is the way to go, you know, not Cooper, uh, colleagues, but you know, more basic oriented textbooks. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's, the thing is, it's, it's extremely complex. You want to be good as a BCBA. So you have to stay up on that literature and stay up on your clients and stuff like that. And then, you know, to go and read it a bunch of other stuff, you know, there's only so much time in the day. Um, so you're not going to be an expert, but I think just the simple appreciation that, uh, you're dealing with these biological behavioral organisms and not only thinking about the, uh, you know, DRA, you can manipulate reinforcement in certain ways. Uh, I think it's, it's an important appreciation to have. All right, cool. Well, um, um, what, so let's take this perhaps back towards, the the applied world then um so it seems you guys have kind of made the case for understanding these things at a more fundamental level so um one of the things that the review article was um talked about the train and hope strategy we alluded to that a a, a few minutes ago uh i'm sure that's that's something that listeners are very familiar with in terms of their um you know their their uh, aba coursework and things like that but you know, we also have plenty of students who are tuning in. So talk about the train and hope strategy, the problems with it. But also, I think you mentioned some that there are times where it's perfectly appropriate, uh, which, which, um, uh, which I guess surprised me in some respects, because sometimes that is vilify, like train and hope is like a dirty word. You know, it's like, oh, they're just training and hoping, you know. So l- l- walk us through this whole train and hope stuff. Um, you can go ahead. <laughs> well, so Train and Hope, if, if you're not familiar, it's from Stokes and Bears, 1977, sort of a seminal article about uh, ensuring generalization and maintenance of treatments. And Train and Hope is really kind of, you know, again, if we're, we're on the topic of uh, problem behavior, you introduce DRA and then so you train it and then you don't really do any work on generalization or maintenance of the treatment and you hope it works, you know, whenever they go home or in a school or whatever. So you train under certain circumstances and you hope it maintains under other circumstances, train and hope. Um, <clears throat> and I wouldn't say that uh, we say it's okay. Sometimes it does work sometimes, of mm-hmm. course, you know, sometimes, um, you know, we've seen uh, in our uh, sort of clinical research, you know, treatment of uh, feeding problems with escape extinction. We want to study something like <laughs> interventions to make our treat, treatments more durable. Yeah. And then we go and do something like a context change or some sort of other manipulation to assess whether if we challenge the behavior, will relapse happen? And we see nothing, right? And then we yeah. test it over here and over there. And for some individuals, the, they just stick. The interventions yeah. work. Um, and so that's not a strategy I think uh, anyone should yeah. really. You shouldn't count on it 
Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you're kind of tackling the problem if it arises, but then by then it might be, you've already given the individual this history that is limited, right? So if you work with individuals with autism, we know they might have a difficulty generalizing to begin with. So you should embed that from the beginning. And what Chris is alluding to in terms of the feeding, it's just, we started noticing that we were doing feeding interventions and kids were very successful in the clinic, but the minute we brought a parent in, it all collapsed. So we were trying to mitigate relapse by embedding multiple trainers, by making sure that caregivers were trained in a particular way. So we're doing all these things cues. and mm-hmm. using cues yeah, to carry treatment, a treatment cue. And so we did several things and we were, you know, hoping to see, not hoping, but we were wanting to replicate this previous finding that we had seen in the clinic of behavior goes back to where it was or gets worse once we bring mom in. But we had done all these things and arrange it in a way that what we saw was maintenance of the treatment effects, which is beautiful. I mean, not if you're a relapse researcher because there was no relapse, <laughs> but clinically it was beautiful because we were able to get these reductions in problem behavior during meal times that maintained across therapists, across contacts, they maintained in the home, they maintained when you changed foods. It was just really, really powerful, you know? So by understanding the basic features of the intervention, kind of what Chris was saying before, you know, um, it allowed us to design an intervention that was tackling these things that we knew could really matter in terms of generalization maintenance that are or should be the goal of any clinical intervention. And there was some prevalence data on sort of resurgence of problem behavior in Wayne Fisher's lab as a brings that out paper, uh, 20, uh, 7, 2018, I think, 2017 or 18. Anyway, um, showing the prevalence in their very large clinical laboratory that, you know, sometimes they get, uh, they ha- they see the train and hope work that when they uh, eliminate alternative reinforcement, they don't see resurgence, but majority of the time they do see it. And there's also a new thing at our 2020 paper, it's actually in the press right now at Java, that shows something similar for renewal. So sometimes you don't get renewal when changing context, um, but a lot of times you will. And so the train and hope is not a strategy so much as, you know, if it works, you're lucky, but um, you can't count on it. That's for sure. Uh, thank you for making that distinction. So what are, what are some, uh, I think you guys mentioned some examples of, of things that uh, clinicians can um, incorporate into their interventions. Um, just a couple of here that I had written down, like multiple context training, training diversely, signals extinction, multiple schedules and things like that. Can you walk us through some of these, uh, some of these different strategies? Yeah. So I, this is where I wanted to jump in and say, like a lot of these things are things that Stokes and Bear suggested. And so Stokes and Bear really did a great job in writing that article and addressing things that are really relevant to treating problem behavior, to teaching skills and so on. So it's not like, uh, what we're saying is uh, wholly new. What we are espousing, though, is a translational approach to go back, you know, where I get on my soapbox, but, uh, you know, an approach that very systematically uh, allows researchers to test uh, various things can make our interventions more effective, that can be transitioned uh, to clinical situations and assessed and those things that work best can be used. Those things that don't work so well can go back into the laboratory to find ways to make them more effective. Um, and here, I, I just want to sort of di- uh, digress just a, a second. Like think about how other areas of science, biomedical research in particular, really works. It's a translational process by design. So you know, uh, you think about communicable diseases. Like right now, the coronavirus. Uh, is a really uh, important thing to figure out. And the only way that they're going to be able to address that problem is that basic researchers come up uh, with uh, vaccines and other approaches to treat the coronavirus, COVID-19, whatever you want to call it, um, that are then moved closer to more clinical trials and stuff like that. They're going to be tested in animals uh, after they get out of the Petri dishes or whatever, uh, the bench science. There's going to be a process of going back and forth. Some stuff is going to work better than others. Sometimes they're going to have to go back to the laboratory uh, and so on and so forth. So it's an interplay that 
that is really the way science works in biomedical research that is kind of, there's no program like that. Like we hope here to start to, to build that. Um, and there have been some efforts, uh, there's some collaborations and stuff, but it's really not kind of the way, the normal practice, the standard operating procedure that it is in biomedical science. You know, if, uh, if we ran into some behavioral problem that was communicable, we don't have the infrastructure to, to deal with it. Um, so I, I hope that, you know, things have come a long way. I think in even five years, yeah. if you go to ABAI, the number of translational uh, research symposia is just, you know, tenfold higher. But I hope in 10 years, it's even, even more than that. And I, cause I, because I think just like with biomedical research, the real progress happens when there's interdis interdisciplinary research going on. Uh, Mason Critchfield in the 2010 paper yeah. talked about this pretty nicely with, you know, HIV, they only made huge strides when uh, there was translational research going on. There was investment from outside parties. There was lots of grant funding. Uh, and so uh, translational research is the, the way to solve those problems quickly and effectively. Yeah, and both of those authors, obviously very well known. And to get back to your question, kind of in, in segue, there was a question. There was a question. That you <laughs> <laughs> this is why I love interviewing academics it's it's the easiest thing in the world like you just you know what one little prompt and i you know i could be scrolling instagram stories and stuff i'm just kidding you know <laughs> that's what you're doing okay. no 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 <laughs> so i mean chris talked about this kind of um going back and forth from the lab to the clinic and i moved my hand because like i'm the clinic person we have an early intervention clinic here in this building and uh, Chris's lab is in this building. So we do a lot of, you know, talking back and forth and I see something and he might tweak it or vice versa, you know, like, what does this look like in the other place? And, uh, and I think this, this allows us to get at critical features of the treatment. So you were asking things like multiple context training and other approaches that clinicians may take. And I think probably the main thing is that it's not really prescriptive, right? So we, we, all of our interventions are individualized for a reason. And one of the things that we are really, we pursue pretty heavily is how can we make really good predictions about which sort of things will be most important for which sort of individuals. So we know that not all learners learn the same way. They don't need the same prompting procedures or error correction or whatever. We also know that not all interventions for decreasing problem behavior are going to work the same way for all individuals, but there are potentially ways for us to be able to evaluate what sort of things will work better for certain individuals because our resources are limited when we're doing clinical work. We can't just throw the kitchen sink or try all the things that Chris can do in the lab because he can do it in 15 minutes in the lab. It'll take me six months in the clinic, right? So how can we early on um, evaluate our learners so that we know what will work better? And those are some of the things that Chris and I kind of talk a lot about and are looking into kind of delving in deeper because we know that we can um, make better use of our resources in terms of learning in the lab and then trans taking it to the clinic and having a real impact without having to spend six months tweaking things or realizing that, Hey, we could have done train and hope and it would have been just fine mm -hmm. um, because that might be fine for some individuals. It's not the best approach, but it might be okay. And maybe you allocate those resources that you would have allocated for doing a more in-depth intervention to something else. Mm -hmm. But, you know, that's why it's not really prescriptive. It's individualized. But I think that's that therein lies the importance of having an ear to the ground and to what's going on in, in other areas and like more basic translational work. Because even if you don't want to look at the matching law equation, understanding what the matching law is is really important because it allows you to think about how you're going to intervene. So I talk about the matching law a lot with my students because I think it's a really good example. Like we talked about DRA before, right? So you start reinforcing something else. And if you think about it from a matching law perspective, I'm not talking about this complicated bound 74 equation. I'm talking about just the principle that you understand that you have to make this other response less effortful, denser in reinforcement, like all these things that we know will drive behavior towards it. And the same thing with this, you don't have to get into the quantitative models or resurgence's choice or any of this really, 
you know, dense literature, I think there are ways for practitioners to tap into things that are relevant to them and still give them a framework from which to work when they're thinking about addressing clinical problems. Yeah. And certainly the matching law is just a fantastic example of that. It's uh, something I talk about all the time when, you know, writing behavior intervention plans and yeah. you know, summarizing the results of an FBA or something along those lines, you know? Yeah. So, But I think there is a certain level of prescription because that's just what co- becomes common practice because, you know, differential reinforcement, um, you know, you, you just, it's used, right? Right. Um, and so the, going back to laboratory research, you, you know, matching all that stuff was identified with laboratory research, but that can, that's the sort of thing that can be identified in laboratory research very quickly. Yes. As Karina was saying, like, you know, it might take a decade to, to figure out something in a clinic with across a bunch of individuals with their own needs and stuff like that. You can isolate those much more quickly in a laboratory situation to figure out one, what are those things that generally are going to be likely to be effective with a bunch of people, right? A bunch of clients and differential reinforcement is one of those. Now, you know, whenever you get into, um, you know, those various things that produce relapse, you know, differential reinforcement, train and hope, that might be enough for a certain ind- subset of individuals. But then that's when the personalized, individualized aspect comes in and having a range of approaches that uh, do show some effectiveness in the laboratory, you can have uh, various approaches to help mitigate the likelihood yeah. of relapse. Um, and, and so the, the, the laboratory, again, so this is sort of aspirational. What can we do uh, down the line in, in figuring out those, those additional individualized things that we can potentially integrate into behavioral treatments um, I, I think that's sort of where we, we need to get. Yeah. I mean, um, I was talking prescriptive, like, I don't want people to think like, okay, well, if I do multiple context training, it's going to work. Or if I use a uh, treatment cue yeah. or signal, then it's going to work. Right. It's because I don't, then it gets to, you just assume that it's going to work without having any evidence that it's going to work for your particular learner as, whereas if you have a framework, it gives you a toolbox and you can draw from it and say, well, this worked, this didn't work. What other things can I grab? And it's this kind of critical thinking approach to solving the the problem rather than they said, if I just train multiple contexts, it's going to work. And I think finding ways, you know, we, you and I talk a lot about how uh, in applied behavior analysis, we, we always talk about function-based treatments and we have evidence to suggest that there's a particular treatment that will be the best, right? Because behavior is maintained by attention or whatever the function of the behavior might be. And I think the features of the intervention also be, need to be reliant on data from the individual rather than mm-hmm. the prescriptive is what I was saying, like this boilerplate, this is what we should use. So that's what I meant by no, I, yeah, I totally get it. We have, you know, have conversations like that all the time with colleagues and, you know, um, uh, we, we want a, a community of practitioners who are, um, really, you know, understand the, you know, what's going on is, instead of just looking at things in terms of like, well, I did, you know, I did the standard functional analysis and, you know, and therefore I should do this and without much, you know, a, a, a lot of analytic thought behind that. Yeah. Yeah. Even biomedical problems, bio, uh, medical problems are, you know, the, the reason why personalized medicine is a term is because individuals need different interventions. And so the various components that comprise uh, potential treatment, you know, some are going to be necessary for successfully treating some individuals and other components will be necessary for treating others. But, you know, the broad, general approach might be the same for everyone. It's just that the details might differ. you know, dosages and stuff like that might differ. Certain drugs might cause side effects in this set of individuals, but not this set of individuals. So I think that's really uh, the, what the translational research can offer is uh, to, to provide a testing ground for what are those range of approaches that can be integrated with a broader strategy of something like differential reinforcement. It. So very cool. Yeah. What are some other areas of translational research that you guys think uh, should be 
uh, t- uh, taken up? Uh, is there other kind of pieces of low hanging fruit out there that uh, that perhaps hasn't been um, studied as well as it could have or should ha- should be? Um, you know, if someone's out there looking for a a, a thesis or a doctoral study, you know, uh, what what sort of ideas or suggestions? you might have if they're interested in, in kind of uh, bridging these two worlds. What are some thoughts you have? What do you guys have on that? I, I would say conditional discriminations. There's a lot of yeah. work that's done in the you know, basic fundamental learning process work um, within and outside behavior analytic frameworks. And there's obviously an incredible amount of research that's going on in particular procedures to uh, conduct trials with conditional discriminations and matching the sample. Um, but you know, I think like Bill Duby and Bill McElvain's uh, laboratory, um, they really did a great job in using clinically relevant populations and uh, assessing uh, clini- clinically relevant questions. But they're sort of, uh, you know, they're retiring and new generations are coming about, coming up. And I hope they continue with that because really using the things that are understood from the basic laboratory about how stimuli generalize location and timing of reinforcers generalize. And so stimulus control is not perfect and all that stuff applies to uh, these clinical situations. And so it'd be really great to get some, uh, some translational research in conditional discriminations. Yeah. Okay. Um, what um, are, before we wrap up here, are, are there any other uh, thoughts you have on this kind of just general topic? I, I, I do want to ev- end with uh, the uh, advice for the newly minted as we, as we typically do, but uh, anything else on the topic of translational research before we transition to that? Um, I don't have anything else. Yeah. I, I thought a lot about this beforehand. I think we've, we've touched on everything. Yeah. Um, really. And that's, I guess, taps into the newly minted, BCBAs, but you know, getting some understanding of fundamental learning processes is really important uh, for for BCBAs. Um, but in the end, I, I really hope the field goes in a direction where translational research just becomes the status quo way to do research. You know, we'll always have very fundamental areas of research, you know, timing processes and stuff like that that aren't necessarily supposed to be translatable to clinical situations, at least uh, yeah. not right out of the box. But uh, nevertheless, I, I really think a, a systematic and focused trans- sort of uh, research programs that are addressing sort of the big problems. And relapse, I think, is a good example of one of them. Um, you know, conditional discrimination is another area, but um, there are pro- there are probably listeners out there who are thinking of other areas that would be good. And I think the real way, like other areas of science, is to, to develop, develop those translational research programs. Um, but, you know, that's not going to be a BCBA starting those up, of course. So I think uh, a good tool to put in the toolbox is to really appreciate the behavioral processes and underlying behavior. Okay. And I mean, I think also that's where collaboration comes in as well, right? Because you might as a clinician, see something that's interesting and you know there's something out there from basic translational work that is relevant, it's not your area of expertise, and that's when reaching out to others that are experts is probably a really important thing to do. I've had people email me uh, about papers that are more applied, but, you know, they still, how do I do this in my clinic? I want to do this same thing. How do I do it? And that's a perfectly reasonable way to collaborate and grow as a BCBA and more people than one would imagine are really open to that. So I think sometimes, you know, you read a journal article and you see somebody's name and you go to a conference, you're like, Oh, there they are. I'm not going to go talk to them because why would they want to talk to me? Well, they probably do because it's their work and they're passionate about it. And I think it's a really good opportunity to one learn and want to expand the knowledge base of our science being a little bit more open to just like reaching out to somebody and saying, Hey, I read this paper. I need to talk to you about it. They'll be flattered. Yeah, totally. I, uh, I, I 1000% agree with that. You know, any, any 
research paper that I've looked at that uh, I had a question about or anything like that, uh, that I've reached out to the author. Uh, the, I, I can't think of a time where I, th- that has not been well received. Uh, and, and so, um, and, and I would imagine that from your perspective, you want that feedback as well, not just like the attaboys and stuff like that, but like, Hey, I tried this or I, I don't get this. Yep. Or I didn't understand what you, what, you know, that that's, that's important feedback to get it as, as well as that, you know, so maybe, maybe that's fodder for another, uh, another investigation, or maybe that's, oh, maybe I need to communicate that more clearly or, yep. you know, that particular, so uh, I think yep. that there's, there's multiple ways in which that can be beneficial and uh, from, from both parties. So uh, uh, great advice to end on a uh, great topic to, bring up uh karina thanks for reaching out to me and and suggesting this uh and again uh this will be a a, again an episode where the show notes will be particularly uh uh, helpful and so just go to behavioralobservations.com and check that out and go to science.abainternational.org and check out the science blog so uh karina and chris thanks for joining me today thanks matt thanks for having us it's been a pleasure Thank you for listening to the Behavioral Observations Podcast with Matt Sicoria. You can find Matt's notes on this episode at www.behavioralobservations.com. We also invite you to stay connected with us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash behavioral observations and on Twitter at Behavior Podcast. <laughs>